to talk about how to study metacognition online. And I will start by showing you the tasks that we use um, and the measures we put in place in order to uh, get high quality data. And then afterwards, I will present you with two example studies where we use that approach. But let's maybe start with what is actually metacognition. So it's often defined as thinking about thinking or cognition about cognition. So there is a clear notion of self-reflection here. But it's also quite broad definition. So more specifically, we often define metacognition as a process that monitors and controls other cognitive processes. In the context of decision-making, that would mean that a metacognitive module is monitoring the decision process and can intervene if needed. So the way we study that in the lab is by asking participants to make simple decisions and then rate their confidence. Here you see an example task where participants are asked to rate whether there are more dots on the left or on the right side of the screen. And then after each decision, they give a confidence rating. And metacognition hereby describes the ability to discriminate between correct and incorrect decisions based on confidence. So basically over many, many trials, confidence ratings should statistically track choice accuracy, whereby confidence should be higher when a correct decision was made. The way we can formalize that is by looking at the confidence distributions for correct and incorrect decisions. So if these two distributions are really overlapping, that means there's no good differentiation between correct and incorrect decisions, um, resulting in low metacognitive ability. Whereas high metacognitive ability is described basically by a large separation in the confidence distributions of these two trial types. And although we measure metacognition in quite simple tasks in the lab, this process of self-awareness, you know, might have relevance for quite a few real world issues. For instance, with respect to mental health, um, one of the symptoms of depression is that people tend to have um, negative evaluation of their own behaviors, uh, implying a role of metacognition. But also in something completely different, as for instance, political polarization, we might assume a role of metacognition. And that's something I'm personally more interested in. So the reason for that is, you know, we're usually quite good in detecting flaws in the argument of the opposing political side, but, you know, often we're not critical with our own political convictions. So in hereby an inability to detect own wrong beliefs might actually lead us to, you know, develop quite extreme and quite radical political beliefs. However, if we want to study a link between metacognition and the, these real world issues, we basically need to look at a wide range of attitudes, uh, sampling from the full spectrum um, and having people with, with all sorts of backgrounds, which is just something that we usually don't have in our labs. And that was really the main motivation to take this research online. However, before we started that research agenda, it wasn't quite clear whether we would actually be successful. Um, because metacognition in the lab is studied usually with psychophysical tasks that are notorious for their tight experimental setup. And the reason why we do that is in order to study metacognition, we need to have a quite exact control over the stimulus strength that we present as it needs to be at threshold level. So participants need to be able to do a task, but needs to be really challenging for them. Um, because only then we get a quite uh, meaningful variety of confidence ratings. And moreover, we also really need a mix between correct and incorrect decisions. Otherwise, we're, we're not even able to calculate our measures of metacognitive ability. In order to ensure that, usually we study metacognition by using psychophysical tasks where we basically put participants in a dark room, you know, in an exactly measured distance to the screen and then they perform perceptual decision-making tasks. So for instance, here you see a random dot motion task where participants have to judge whether uh, the dots are moving to the left or to the right side of the screen. And we as experimenters can exactly control how strong the evidence is by increasing or decreasing the amount of dots moving coherently in one direction. So psychophysics is on one side of, of the spectrum of experimental control. 
And often it's assumed that online research is just on the opposite side, you know, as people might have you know, very different setups that they do the tasks on. For instance, people might have different screen sizes and that arguably could influence um, especially this kind of perceptual task. But then also it's always assumed that there are all these distracting influences at home um, preventing people to really pay attention to the task. So let me just tell you what we came up with to solve these issues. So first of all, we decided to stick to perceptual decision making even in our online tasks. And the main argument for that is that these kind of tasks enable us to adaptively change the difficulty for each participant. So we use the staircase procedure, which is quite widely used in psychophysics, which basically means that on every single trial, we slightly change the evidence strength in response to participants' performance. So for instance, if a participant gets a decision correct, then we reduce the evidence strength slightly, so the task becomes a bit more difficult. And on the other hand, if a person makes an incorrect decision, then we make the task a bit easier and increase the evidence strength. And this is something, by the way, you can't really use the task builder for, you have to code that up, but I think it's really uh, worth the effort. Because if you do that um, throughout the whole task, then you can really adapt um, the difficulty for each participant, and to a large degree, that then accounts for the differences in setups. Moreover, um, if you staircase throughout the whole task, participants will converge on a set performance level that is known to us as experimenters. So for instance, we often staircase in a way that participants will get 70% correct decisions. And that always works as long as the participant is attentive to the task. So we have already like a built-in attention check in these tasks. And finally, since we know quite, quite narrowly how, how well a participant will perform, we can then also pay them um, based on that task performance and really, you know, usually we pay them quite a lot of bonus payment based on their performance to ensure that they're really motivated to do the task as well as possible. So that is in theory what we did. Let me maybe just show you how the task looked like in practice. So participants were tasked to judge whether there are more flickering dots in patch on the left side or on the right side of the screen, and then they rate the confidence. And by the way, for all of our experience, we always force participants into full screen mute. So if they are full screen, let's start to make a decision, they rate the confidence. SD is really quite an engine. So it's not like the side has more dots. So after participants have performed this task, then we also uh, apply a few exclusion criteria to ensure that we only have participants in there who took the task seriously. And first of all, as I said, we roughly know um, how good participants should perform because of our adaptive change of difficulty. That also means we just exclude participants who don't fall within a narrow range around this level. Um, and that gets already rid of you know, most participants who might not have paid attention to the task. But then on top of this, we also um, know quite exactly what kind of reaction time distributions we would expect for this kind of perceptual task. And it has really this stereotypical chip. And since, since each participant gives kind of a hundred or a few hundred uh, decisions, and we have a few hundred participants, we usually end up with, you know, nearly half a million of trials um, per study. And if you plot the reaction time of all these decisions, we see a very nicely following this theoretical uh, distribution. But then also we can identify parts where our empiric distribution deviates from the theoretical expected distributions. For instance, we see way more trials. Participants uh, have very fast, sometimes below 150 milliseconds. Um, and that might be an indication 
that on these decisions, they just click through the task without paying attention. And then what we do is we just exclude these trusts again. Applying these kind of exclusion criteria usually gives us an exclude rate of 25% of participants. And that seems quite a lot. But on the other hand, um, it's also a quite high hurdle to take. So if a participant uh, meets all these criteria, we can be quite sure that this participant really you know, did the task as good um, as they could. Um, and just looking at our data that we got from these online experiments and compare them to data from the lab, we actually see um, that distributions of metacognitive ability look very similar for lab-based tasks as well as online tasks, indicating that really through all these measures, we get very high quality data even online. Maybe the distribution is a bit wider online, but that's also part of the reason we took the research online to, to really, you know, sample from a wider range of metacognitive abilities. So after having ensured that we have quality data, we then can go on and answer our empirical questions. And as I said, I was specifically interested in the relation between metacognition and radical political beliefs. So in this study, we acquired data from two large samples and they, each participant conducted this um, perceptual metacognition task and on top of this answered a bunch of uh, political questionnaires measuring their political orientation and also um, their general belief rigidity um, and stuff like intolerance for opposing political beliefs. We then conduct a factor analysis over these items, finding that two factors of interest best describe the interrelation between all these questionnaires. Um, the first factor measured political orientation on a single dimension from left to right. And the sector, second factor was labeled dogmatic intolerance. That is the factor we were mainly interested in. And this measures something like general belief rigidity as well as intolerance for opposing political beliefs. And just to give you a flavor of what it really measures, the two highest loading items were, um, my opinions are right and will stand the test of time. And the second item was, my opinion about immigration is the only correct view on this issue. So we then ask, how are these two factors related to each other? And we found that there was a quadratic relationship showing that people on the far left, people on the far right, with similarly dogmatic and intolerant views as you as you might expect from something that measures political uh, radicalism. We we then went on and asked, can we explain individual differences in this um, dogmatism factor uh, by task measures related to metacognition from our perceptual task? And controlling for band potential confounding covariates, we find indeed there is a relationship and that uh, replicates across our two samples, showing that people who are more dogmatic and intolerant show reduced metacognitive sensitivity. And specifically that was driven by them showing a deficit in recognizing their own mistakes, indicating that, you know, a domain general metacognitive ability might be relevant also for um, issues like political beliefs. Then we went on and tried to extend these findings in a study that I did in collaboration with Leon Schulz, where we asked, is it maybe that dogmatic people not only show a deficit in, in recognizing their own mistakes, but could also be that they might not be as willing to seek out additional information that could re help them to revise their opinions. So in this study, we followed a very similar approach. The task looked a tiny bit different. So participants, again, saw the flickering dots and made an initial decision directly combined with the confidence rating. But then they were actively asked, do you want to see um, more information? So do you want to see the dots again? And if they said yes, they saw the flickering dots again. If they said no, they just two, saw two black squares. And afterwards, in both cases, they had to give a final decision that was rewarded based on task performance. Um, and in this kind of task, we found that more dogmatic participants were actually less likely to 
actively seek out additional information. And again, we replicated this across the two samples. Um, and more specifically, this effect was driven by dogmatic people using their confidence less adaptively in order to inform their information seeking decisions. So specifically, when dogmatic participants had low confidence in an initial decision, they showed a reduced tendency to seek out more potentially corrective information. So these were just like two example studies um, using our metacognition tasks online. Um, to sum up, I hope I have convinced you that you can use metacognition tasks online. And it's important that you, you know, staircase the task difficulty, that you incentivize participants for good task performance, and that you just exclude dodgy behavior. But if you do all of that, I think um, online tasks to measure metacognition can be a very powerful tool to uh, look at individual differences, for instance, in our case, related to dogmatic political beliefs. I would like to thank Steve Fleming, Leon Schulz, and Ray Dolan, who all contribute to this work. And especially a uh, big thanks to Steve, who is my supervisor, who was the driving force behind this research agenda.